as a teenager going through uh, uh, a very brutal sexual assault, the first thing that I realized was the immense amount of isolation that I was subjected to, both within my family and the world outside. That was something like a strong, you know, undigestible anger. And very interestingly, and, I, and that's why I think my life is a providence and, and I'm kind of the chosen one, because somehow I never felt like a victim. And the need of the world to look at me as a victim bothered me in a big way, because I think people were very comfortable looking at somebody very upset and depressed and crying and like asking for somebody's sympathy and pity. But people couldn't digest this person who said, okay, I didn't do any mistake, meaning, these eight men have violated me. Oh, why are you all blaming me for a crime that I've not committed? So that anger got channelized into a kind of a, a direction in my life. And I was very clear that, you know, from then on, my every breath of my life, uh, till the end of my life, would be to, to look at the world of sex crime and uh, more deeply when I thought about it, I thought sex trafficking is far more bigger violation in the world of sex crime because uh, a sex crime happens once to a person or maybe a couple of times. But here is a systemic thing, you know, uh, a whole world of people are conspiring to exploit the vulnerability of another person and, and sexually violating that person for commercial purposes. I thought that is where my, my anger needs to be chastised. From then to now, it is that anger that sustains my mission. The entire unfairness of victimizing a victim for no fault of hers. And that started my work. Primarily, I think we need to challenge the construct of masculinity from our childhood. Today, I think it's high time that every father, every mother, every human being questions how they bring up their sons. What is it that we are teaching our sons which makes them believe that they want to buy sex from a five-year-old child or an eight-year-old child or a 10-year-old child? Somewhere, something is very badly screwed up in the way we are creating the construct of masculinity. And that needs to be challenged today because today, if millions of children, as young as three and four years old, are sold as sex slaves, there's something very significantly wrong, wrong with our men. Not just in my country, but everywhere in the globe. And therefore, the I would say much more than terrorism, much more than some huge international problems, I would look at this as the biggest problem in the world. Because half the humanity is men. Half, the other half is women. So if half the humanity is carrying a, a sense of bestiality, a sense of absolutely disproportionate understanding of human lives, then there's something wrong with the way we are growing up. And I want to challenge every parent, every mother, every father, every teacher, every institution that we come in contact right from the moment that we are born till the time we die is, is this the right composition of men that we are bringing up? Is this the right composition of boys that are growing up? I was again uh, very lucky because the anger in me was also simultaneously uh, converted into a inner, you know, a journey within myself. And what I could see is a huge amount of power that I possessed. Uh, in, and it was very, very important for me to see that power, realize that power, and get to know my own self because support from the outer world was limited. 
My parents didn't know how to deal with me. My family didn't know how to deal with me. The community didn't know how to deal with me. So I had to depend on that inner reserve that I had. And that inner reserve brought in the optimism because when you can see how your pain can be channelized as power and harnessed into something very concrete and that concrete sense of direction can actually impact the life of, of some person or awaken somebody else to look at things in a different way. You, you see the anger becoming a positive energy, positive energy of hope, positive energy of possibilities and alternatives because to me it was important you know in my journey not to be consumed with the the negativity of the anger but to convert that the convert anger and I, I look at anger as a extraordinary positive energy you know and connect can convert that into a volcano of possibilities you know making things happen and and what is concrete and what is tangible is the only thing that can reinforce faith and optimism in you and that's what i've been doing the last last many years is to create those alternatives which is kind of reaffirming my own belief that it is possible and therefore the world around me also starts seeing those tangibles and say yes it is possible to move ahead from the inception of Prashwala, I looked at it as a laboratory. A laboratory of experiments to counter trafficking. For me, it was very important because all around me, the kind of messages that was coming into my myself was, no, this is not possible. Prostitution is a necessary evil. Sexual slavery cannot be abolished. This is something like it is required for the society to be sustained. And therefore, it was very important for me to show to the world that no, you know, there are, there is an alternate world that is possible. And that alternate, and that alternate world order that I believe in, Prashwala is that little laboratory to create that. So from then to now, it continues to be a laboratory. In the inception, it was small experiments. Now there are bigger experiments. We started with a small experiment to prevent children from intergenerational prostitution, which, which again taught us lessons in partnership, lessons in having faith in the, in the community that you are, you, you want to serve, you know, because in, 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 in the whole vision and mission to bring change, sometimes we become consumed with our own, you know, our own, uh, competence and cap capacities and we believe that we are the ones bringing change actually we are not bringing change it we are facilitating the change in in in, in the in, in in not only in ourselves but people around you so you are the change you are bringing that change and you're carrying that change so a small intervention from pre for prevention then moved on to become say rescue work in that little journey we understood what is to partner with communities? Slowly we understood what is to partner with stakeholders, like the police, like the judiciary. And it didn't happen like, oh, I had the strategy and I knew what to do. Everything I had to fail 100 times, including, you know, a, a, a death of a, a staff of mine who was murdered right, right, right in front of me. In, with that death, I learned that it is, doesn't make business sense at all to be doing the heroic, you know, activities. So change has to be strategized. That I learned by falling multiple times. So from then, moving to rescue towards, now what do we do with people whom you're rescuing? You brought out children, you brought out adults from world of sexual slavery. What do you do with them? They, they, they are in a state of despair. So, and, and the world is not understanding what, what you're trying to do. So handing over this group of people to somebody else doesn't make sense. And therefore, we had to experiment on the possibilities that make sense to them. I would hope a future would be a day when Prajwala will close shop. I don't want an organization like Prashwala to sustain. Prashwala is a reminder of, of, uh, of human misery and trade, trade in human misery. And therefore, uh, the, my job done or 
the vision and mission that I look at is a day that no organization like Prashwala to be there at all. But in a short term manner, one, if one talks that, we'll, I, I look at Prashwala as, as, a, as a larger laboratory to bring in those alt, real concrete, you know, alternatives which the world is able to replicate at a large scale. So if what we do can become some kind of a model that I can carry to the, throughout the world to, to adapt and replicate and become that voice for victims everywhere in the globe. I, I, I hope to become that, that voice for victims, not me, my country, but, but for, uh, for the world.